Poster session, aren't we? Right. All going. Will be David Pallon, and it'd be an interesting talk on surprises in quantum error correction. All right, yes. Well, thanks the, the organizers for inviting me. And indeed, that was the kind of subjective title, but maybe a more uh, accurate title is Quantum Error Correction Beyond the IID Pauli Noise Model. And uh, I'll be presenting work that was done by Andrew and Pavitran, and some of the ideas also were borrowed from uh, Nicola. Um, OK, so uh, let's uh, just to, to motivate this, uh, this presentation. Uh, let's uh, just put things into context. So let's say we want to execute some quantum algorithm that requires n logical gate. So uh, to simulate something like this iron sulfur molecule, uh, the, the estimates are that we need uh, 10 to the 12 to 10 to the 15 logical gates. Uh, so of course, each of these gates will need to be error corrected to some accuracy delta so errors don't build up during the computation. Uh, so what's the relation between delta and n? Well, you know, if the, the total error will be n times delta if the error adds up coherently. So that's, that's definitely an upper bound on the total error. But uh, maybe if we're a bit more optimistic, the, the, the errors will add up stochastically, leading to a, an error buildup uh, square root of n times delta which tells us that you know, we need logical accuracy uh, in somewhere between 1 over square root of n and 1 over n. We don't really know how things will scale. And if we combine these numbers, that gives us you know, a logical failure rate that needs to be somewhere between 10 to the minus 6, which is the super op optimistic uh, uh, logical error rate that we need, all the way down to 10 to the minus 15. Um, so for this talk, uh, so this is extremely vague, of course, but so for this talk, I'll be using the number 10 to the minus 10, which I think is a, a good target that we should s shoot for. Uh, but of course, this is something we have to study in more details. But uh, <clears throat> we know that if the physical noise rate, epsilon, and throughout the talk, I'll consistently be using epsilon to, uh, uh, to, for, for the physical noise rate, and delta for the logical noise rate. So provided that the physical noise rate is subthreshold, well, we can achieve this delta uh, at a cost which is polylogarithmic. So maybe you, you, know, you, you would think that we don't need to care so much about the, the overhead because it's only polylogarithmic, but uh, we've learned that the, the constants can be very important. Uh, so therefore, the kind of question that has been driving part of my research for last you know, maybe almost decade is given a physical noise rate epsilon, how much error correction do I need to achieve a logical noise rate delta? Okay, so that's the kind of question that I'll bring up throughout this talk just as a motivation for the, the other questions that I'll be asking. All right, so um, um, now let me talk about some numerical tools that we've developed to try to address this question. So uh, this talk is not about uh, describing how, we, uh, how these things work. It's more about showing you results that we've obtained from these simulations. But I just want to uh, say a little bit um, about uh, what we have done. So <clears throat> the point is that uh, simulating, um, simulating a realistic non-model, uh, realistic noise model, is computationally <laughs> Uh, difficult. So a lot of simulations have been done for Pauli noise model, and Pauli noise model are, are like the, you know, free fermion theory uh, of of um, quantum information. And as soon as we have realistic noise, well, we are faced with a really quantum many-body problem. So the only way we can fully simulate uh, um, quantum error correction in the presence of non-Pauli and generic noise is just simulate you know, the density matrix on the whole Hilbert space, and that has an exponential cost. So our contribution can be summarized by saying that we've, we've, uh, we study fault tolerance with realistic noise uh, using numerical methods that we borrow from condensed, condensed matter physics, and in particular, quantum many-body physics. So these tools are essentially uh, tensor network methods. So these are things you may have heard about, like density matrix normalization group, 
uh, projected entanglement pair states, uh, multi-scare entanglement renormalization onsets, or these things are often better known by their uh, acronyms, DMRG, PEPs, and MERA. And we've used all of these and others in different contexts uh, for quantum error correction in my group. Uh, so I won't go into the details of how we use them, but let me just uh, um, first of all say what constitutes a simulation for a generic noise model. So um, here's what goes into a simulation. So you have to prepare a state vector, which lives inside the code, so um, a quantum state. Um, and then you imagine applying the noise to the density matrix. Uh, now, here's an important departure from a uh, Pauli noise model. So a Pauli noise model is, uh, uh, is an example of a stochastic noise model. So you can imagine that at every time you have a pure state, you just don't know what that pure state is, right? Um, or, and in fact, not only this, but at every time you have a pure stabilizer state, uh, and you just don't know what that stabilizer state is. Um, so when the, when the noise is a stochastic noise model, like a mixture of unitary, instead of applying the CPTP map to the density matrix, you can sample from that noise model. So say, uh, at this time, you know, it should be the depolarizing model, but uh, instead of applying the depolarizing channel to the, the state, I'm just going to pick a Pauli matrix at random and apply that Pauli matrix. So on average, it does the right thing. But, if, uh, but some channels are not stochastic, so you really need to just take the density matrix and apply the CPTP map. Okay? So uh, already you can see that there's a, a larger cost because you have to keep track of a mixed state instead of a pure state. Um, but that's just one of the extra costs. <clears throat> All right, so once you've done this, you need to uh, sample uh, a syndrome bit. So again, this is an important departure from Pauli noise model. So if you sample a Pauli noise model, so you start with a code state, then you apply some Pauli matrices, the rest of the algorithm is deterministic. If you know what Pauli matrices were apply, you know what the syndrome should be, and then you do error correction. But if you have a generic noise model, uh, the syndrome is not deterministic, so you have to simulate, you have to compute the probability of uh, each syndrome outcome and then pick a syndrome at random. So that will require some computation. Once you have a syndrome, you need to run your decoding algorithm, so find a correction uh, based on the observed syndrome, then you apply that correction to the post-measurement state. So, so once you simulate this probability, of course, you need to simulate the collapse of the wave function. Uh, and then, so you're done simulating error correction, but uh, in a simulation, there's something else we want to do. We want to check if we've done the right thing. So you know, at this point, the simulation of error correction is done, but now we need to evaluate how good error correction perform. So we want to figure out what logical transformation was resulted from all these uh, steps. Um, and maybe we want to repeat this for many, many different input states, and this will allow us to perform uh, quantum process tomography. Um, or you could use something like the Jamikowski isomorphism uh, as a shortcut. Okay? So if you had all these ingredients, if you could do all these things efficiently, uh, then, you know, someone could hand you a noise model and a code and uh, using everything that was on a previous slide, you could output a syndrome, you could output the probability of that syndrome, and you could also output what is the logical channel condition on that syndrome. So let's say that the, the code encodes a single qubit. Well, at the end of the day, that single qubit has undergone a transformation. Ideally, that transformation would be the identity if error correction worked perfectly. But there will be some residual noise described by this logical CPTP map. And then, of course, you can repeat this to accumulate statistics over all the different syndrome and compute things like what's the average channel, what's the average logical error. And the logical error would be like, what's the distance of this channel from the identity, and you could average this, or you could take uh, the distance of the average, and these are different figure of merit, I'm not sure which one's the right one, and so on. So you could c compute any statistical quantity you want. Okay, 
So uh, <clears throat> in the next two slides, I want to tell you that this can be done for, um, uh, for two important class of codes. One is the surface code. So uh, let me tell you why this can be done uh, semi-efficiently. Uh, well, and what I mean by semi-efficiently is more efficiently than just brute force, you know, keeping track of the density matrix. So the surface code basis state, the logical basis states, are PEPs. Okay, so they can re be represented by uh, a two-dimensional tensor network. Uh, so if you take the density matrix that remains something that we can call a PEPO. So this is projected entangled pair states, projected entangled pair operator. And then provided that the noise model has some nice locality condition, after you apply the noise, it will remain a PEPO. So what type of, what type of noise model uh, will, will preserve the PEPO structure? Well, I, I, I call it the PEPSO. Okay, so th this is kind of a joke. Uh, but uh, so it's a PEP super operator. Uh, but I want to I want to argue that this is an extremely general class of noise model, and I think that it probably captures you know most physically relevant noise model that you may encounter. Um, uh, pr well, yeah, or at least you know tensor network are a very general class of noise. Of course, the 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 topology of the tensor network should sort of mimic the, the topology of the wiring in your device. Uh, <clears throat> so for instance, if I have you know, independent noise on every qubit, that's of course uh, described by a PEPSO. Uh, if you have uh, noise with short range correlation, that's described by a PEPSO. So you can have very, very general noise model. And, uh, and under these, this family of noise model, your density matrix, after having, uh, after the noise is still a two-dimensional tensor network. So the next thing you need to do is compute the probability that when you measure a syndrome bit, you get the value plus or minus one, and that probability that is given by Born's rule, and it's written down here, that boils down to contracting a two-dimensional tensor network. Uh, the post-measurement state is also a PEPO. You just increase the bond dimension a little bit when you apply this projector. Uh, now, when you apply the correction, that completely preserves the two-dimensional tensor network because that's a purely lo local operation. Uh, and lastly, you want to figure out what has happened. So you need to do like quantum process tomography. So you need to measure the expectation value of your logical operators. That also boils down to contracting a two-dimensional tensor network. Okay, so we see that the two computationally uh, uh, hard steps in this computation, which are this one here and this one, boil down to contracting 2D tensor network. Now, there exists efficient, like polynomial, approximate contraction algorithm, but in this work, we choose to do these contraction exactly. Okay, so there are uh, no errors in the simulation. Um, so, of course, this, the, the cost of this is exponential, but it's exponential with the, with the width of the lattice. So if you have a, w, a lattice of size W by L, the cost of this will scale like exponentially with the width, but linearly with the, the length, as opposed to exponential with the area, which is what Bruce, brute force would give you, okay? So with this, we are able to simulate fairly large lattices, like 15 by 15, and hopefully we don't need to simulate any bigger lattice because you know 15 by 15 is already quite a big overhead. Okay, the other class of codes for which we uh, have efficient uh, simulator are uh, concatenated codes. So if you know anything about tensor network, you will recognize right away that yes, you can simulate this efficiently because it's a tree. Uh, and, but you know, in terms of error correction, what you can do is for each of these small codes, you can use brute force just to simulate, say, the seven qubit code. So you just write down a seven qubit density matrix and you simulate error correction on that matrix. And uh, after you've done error correction, you will get a single logical qubit CPTP map. And then you just use you know, seven of them as input to your uh, next level. So it's kind of a very natural thing to do. Now you may ask, what type of noise model 
is compatible with this scheme. Uh, well, obviously, uncorrelated noise model. But uh, then if you start thinking more in a tensor net network language, it's what kind of tensor can I put at the bottom of this graph and uh, obtain a, an efficiently contractible tensor network? And there's quite a bit of them. So you could have a tree-like tensor network. You can have an MPS, uh, which would represent some kind of correlation. And you know, there, there's quite a few number of, of um, noise models that are compatible with this scheme. So um, that's all I'm going to say about how we do stuff. Uh, so in the rest of the talk, I want to show you what kind of uh, results that we've obtained using these two simulation tools. OK. So remember that the question that was motivating uh, this research is given a physical noise rate epsilon, how much error correction do I need to achieve my logical noise rate 10 to the minus 10? Well. <clears throat> What do I mean by epsilon? How do I define a noise rate? Okay. So uh, there are a lot of uh, measure of noise out there. So one, maybe the most common one is infidelity. So um, uh, here's the average fidelity of a channel, uh, fidelity to the identity, I should say. And 1 minus this fidelity is the infidelity. This, this has a nice statistical interpretation, and it's measured. Uh, by randomized benchmarking. So it's, it's a quantity that's easily accessible uh, experimentally. If you're a theorist, of course, you like the diamond norm because it composes well. And that's what you're going to use if you prove stuff. If you're lazy, you like the Hilbert-Schmidt norm because you know it's just a trace of a matrix squared. Uh, and there are a lot of other norms. And maybe if you've never paid attention to norms, you're thinking just you know, pick one and move on with your talk. Uh, but it's important because these can, can differ by like a square root, OK? So you can have, uh, um, you know, if you hold the, uh, uh, the, 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 the infidelity fix, uh, the diamond norm, but change the channel, the diamond norm can go anywhere from epsilon to square root of epsilon. So it's very important uh, that you be more specific about what, what norm you, you use. OK, uh, so um, there's been quite a lot of work trying to, you know, or, or a bit of debate about which of these norms should be used. Uh, <clears throat> so uh, one way to solve this is to say, look, just perform quantum process tomography. Give me your, your process matrix, and I will compute the diamond norm for you. And therefore, uh, you know, we can all use this diamond norm. But I don't think the experimentalists will buy into this. Uh, <clears throat> so. Uh, Another clever idea was, all right, so if you, if you just tell me the infidelity um, from, you know, you've performed experiments, and you tell me the infidelity, but I'm a theorist, so I want the diamond norm. And I've just argued that if you only give me the infidelity, I, I, I really don't know what the diamond norm is. But maybe there's another quantity that you can measure. And combined with the infidelity, I get a good estimate of the diamond norm. And indeed, uh, there's another quantity called unitarity. And, if, and, and it's easily measurable. And if you know the unitarity and the infidelity, you get a pretty good idea of what the diamond norm is. Okay? So you get a much tighter balance. Uh, so to me, all this debate um, should be motivated by the question of you know, what's a useful norm? Not whether it, it applies to proofs or not. It's like, to me, a norm should be one that allows you to predict how well a channel will, uh, will react to a fault tolerant scheme. Okay? So this is the kind of question that we started to look at using these simulations. And here's uh, some, some data. So, uh, <clears throat> so at the bottom axis here is uh, the physical noise rate as measured by the diamond distance. Okay? So this is the diamond distance away from the identity. Uh, now, we are using Steen's error correction, and uh, we're doing three levels of concatenation. Uh, this blue line is the depolarizing channel. Okay? So this is just measuring the strength of the depolarizing noise um, as, yeah, with, as measured by the diamond norm. Um, and this axis here is the logical error or logical failure rate 
as measured by the infidelity. Okay. Uh, now you can see a few bumps here, and these are statistical errors. I said that the calculations were exact. They are, but we are sampling the syndrome. Uh, and I want to maybe say a few things about this. So like when you, when you perform an experiment, you are also sampling the syndrome, right? I mean, every time you, 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 you'd be measuring the syndrome, you'd be getting a different result. So in this sense, these simulations are exact simulation of what would be happening in an experiment. And these statistical fluctuations are the same that you would encounter in an experiment. Now, I'm sorry, maybe you can't see this one as well, but there's a green line down here, uh, which is uh, for another channel, which is just systematic rotation of every qubit about the z-axis. Okay, so it's, if you can't see it, it, it's pretty much at the bottom of this. All the other dots here are just random channels. Okay, so, and I should say every point here uh, is um, as, as 10,000 statistics, and they're, are nearly 300,000 points. Um, um, so, uh, right, so what do we learn from this? Uh, so let's say we were shooting for, for this 10 to the minus 10, right? That's the logical noise rate that we were shooting for. Uh, well, what kind of physical noise rate do we need for this? We need something that's in between, you know, somewhere between 3% and 11%, okay? So that's, Kind of very, extre kind of very broad, and maybe it, it's more dramatic if you turn turn in, uh, turn around and say, let's let's say I have a device, you know, and because this is usually what's reported in papers, oh, we have a device which achieves you know one percent error or 0.1 percent error, or in this example, you know, 10 percent. How well would it perform in a fault tolerant scheme? Well. Um, the logical failure rate after error correction would be anything between 10 to the minus 14 and 10 to the minus 3, okay? So I get the, the message from this plot, and that was kind of one of the surprises to me, is that if you only know the noise rate uh, of your physical channel, it's well, it's, it's impossible to predict how well it will perform in a fault tolerance scheme, okay? Um, and you could say, well, well, so I should say that we've plotted this uh, with every possible measure here and every possible measure here, every possible measure we could think of. And uh, this is sort of typically what we see, okay? There are better ones. Uh, oh, yeah, I just want to say, notice, this is maybe some good news, that uh, depolar depolarizing noise is sort of the worst one. And that's, why is this good news? Because most simulations to date have used depolarizing noise. So maybe this is telling us that things in real life will be much better than we anticipate, okay? And the systematic rotations are kind of close to the worst. They're not exactly the worst one, but uh, they are close to. Oh, just another small detail. There's kind of a gap here. Uh, and I don't want you to pay attention to this. And the reason is because I did not tell you how we generate these random channels. And there's no notion of uniform measure over all channels, okay? So clearly, the, the ch we chose the channels in a group covariant way. But otherwise, there's no uniform measure. So th that's probably just an artifact of the way we sample the channels. And there's probably, well, there surely is another way of sampling that will, would fill this gap, okay? So I don't think this is... Uh, very important. It would be nice maybe to have a physically motivated way of sampling the channels. We just, you know, picked one at random. Okay. Uh, yeah, so here's what happens if I change this axis here by infidelity. Uh, well, things look a little bit better, and I save three orders of magnitude, okay? But it's still, you know, eight orders of magnitude fluctuation. So it still provides only extremely coarse information about how well the, co the code is going to perform. The other thing is that the rotations and depolarizing have switched. In this picture, depolarizing noise is the worst, and rotation is the, the best, okay? That's very annoying. Uh, and, and of course, if you start playing with this axis, oops, sorry, with this axis here, 
or you can make things switch just any way you want, okay? So tell me, tell me the conclusion you want, and I'll make you a plot that gets you there. <laughs> so it's a bit annoying, I must say. So what's the conclusion that we've learned from these simulations is that uh, it's not possible to even crudely predict the logical failure rate of a fault-tolerant scheme given only the noise rate of the physical channel as measured by any of the standard noise metric, infidelity, diamond norm. So these are the ones we've tried. Infidelity, diamond norm, channel entropy, error probability, Euclidean norm, and trace norm. Okay? And they all, they all look as bad. Uh, one, maybe one thing. So here I haven't gone, be, so everything here was like for channel coding. I haven't gone into fault tolerance, which is where I wanted to go with this project, but we had so many problems just in the code, channel coding scheme. But uh, I wanna argue that the conclusions I get are still valid in a fault tolerant uh, uh, framework. The reason is that, you know, this is about you have a manifold of error. So I'll consider like the error model manifold. And in this manifold, when I say, you know, infidelity is 1%, I'm, I'm specifying a hyperplane. And then I'm looking at how much the logical failure rate can fluctuate in this hyperplane. Now, if I want to do fault tolerance, I'm just increasing tremendously the, the dimension of this manifold because now I need to specify what's the noise model for the C0, what's the noise model for the Hadamard, what's the noise model for every gate. Here I only had a noise model for the, the identity, okay? So I was hoping to get the opposite conclusion that yeah, yeah, you know, if you tell me the noise rate, you get a pretty good idea. And now I would have had to convince you with numerics that it also holds under fault tolerance. But I got the opposite conclusion. Like, no, th these things are, are useless to predict, uh, predict the failure rate, and things can, will only get worse if you, once you go to fault tolerance, okay? Uh, <clears throat> something else that I've learned is that the diamond norm does not stand out in any way. So, like, the, you know, insisting that everything, at the end of the day, should be reported in terms of diamond norms, um, I, I don't see any, any reasons to do this. Um, and maybe, one piece of good news is that incoherent noise is the worst. And that, that might be opposite to widespread belief, but I've already told you, uh, well, so, you know, because most numerics has, to date has been done in this worst case scenario, but of course this statement is norm dependent. Uh, so depending on what norm you like, this might be good news or bad news. Okay. So uh, let's move on um, to, um, other type of simulations that we've done. Uh, so this, these will be for surface code, but before let me just motivate the kind of question that we'll be looking at. Uh, so if you do the standard Monte Carlo simulation um, uh, in the stabilizer formalism, these only work for Pauli noise model, which are not physical. So one approach that people have used before is to say, all right, so you have your physical channel and you'd like to know how well it performs in error correction so let let's but but error correction i can only simulate pauli noise model so let let us approximate the channel by a pauli channel so the simplest way to do this is that is just to ignore non pauli contributions to the channel so um if you write down the like the chi matrix you just kill all the off diagonal terms so an example if you if you have a qubit that gets rotated well, that's the, the rotated density matrix. Uh, but if you want to approximate this by a poly channel, you would just kill the cross terms and you would say, well, here's my noise model, okay? Um, and then this you can simulate efficiently in the stabilizer formalism. Uh, right. Okay, so uh, there's, there's another standard poly approximation, which is called the honest poly approximation. Um, because, well, the problem with this twirl approximation is that you have no control. Maybe this channel is much nicer than the ch channel you started with. So the conclusions that you get in your simulations cannot be trusted. So the mod that was the motivation for the honest poly approximation. It's to say, all right, let's try it. So we have this physical channel. Let's try to find a poly channel 
that approximates this physical channel as, as best as possible, but yet does not outperform it. Okay, so mathematically, you say, let's try to find a channel that's as close as possible, but which is further away from the identity than the original channel. And that turns out to be a, a nice um, semi-definite program, which you can solve. And you can just find this channel P and then run your simulation with P. Uh, so, uh, uh, yeah. Uh, and I think this is a very nice idea. Uh, and it generalized to, um, uh, to Clifford noise. So you could include, uh, Clifford noise is nice also because you can include that in stabilizer uh, simulations. Uh, and this was done uh, by the group of, of Ken. And, and I think you could go beyond this. You could even say, what's the closest uh, Clifford noise model with some correlations and so on? So I think this is a very rich um, idea. But anyhow, uh, <clears throat> so we looked at what kind of results you obtain using these poly approximations com and compare them with exact simulations. So first, let's look at uh, the surface code threshold. Uh, so OK, just sanity check. Depolarizing, well, it's already a Pauli noise model. So you know, there's no, uh, of course, all these approximations give you exactly the same thing. All right, damping, which uh, uh, this is a noise model where uh, you know, 1 goes to 0, but 0 does not go to 1. Uh, the exact threshold that we get from these tensor network simulation is 39%. The Pauli twirl gives the same result, and the honest Pauli approximation gives 6%. So that's kind of good. I, I mean, you know, the honest Pauli approximation says it gives you a pessimistic view, that's, and, and it, it works as advertised. So that's, that's all right. Uh, and Z rotation is, is unclear. There's, there's kind of, well, we'll get back to Z rotations later. It's not clear that there's a threshold for that. Um, OK, and these were done on fairly large lattices. There, I just want to emphasize, there's no way you could do this without the tensor network tools. You could not uh, um, just um, you know, simulate these density matrix. But of course, if you're Sergei, you do this with free fermion, like everything else. Right? Uh, OK, so that, that was for the threshold. Um, and let's now look at sub-threshold behavior. Um, so this is for the amplitude damping. Once again, for amplitude damping, um, so the full line is the exact simulation. And, and now we're um, plotting this as a function of the lattice width. Um, and this is the, the logical error rate, as measured by the diamond distance here. Um, so the, the twirl approximation is in very, very good agreement with the exact one. And as advertised, the honest poly approximation is much worse. Um, so you could, you know, think, oh, well, the Pauli twirl approximation seems pretty good. But then you move on to another channel, systematic rotation. And now, I mean, it's kind of as bad as it could get, right? You have your, your exact simulation here, uh, the, pal uh, the, the twirl approximation and the, uh, the uh, honest Pauli approximation, which are just like each of them are 10 orders of magnitude away from the, the right answer, okay? So... Uh, the conclusion here is that it's not possible to even crudely predict the logical failure rate of a fault-tolerant scheme from known Pauli approximations. Okay? Uh, the 12 approximation gives a good threshold estimate in the examples we looked at, but you know, that there, there might be five examples. So we might just have been lucky. So we saw for amplitude damping, the twirl gave good prediction, but the honest Pauli approximation was grossly overestimating the failure rate. And for the Z rotation, both were totally off. Okay. Uh, all right, so I think this motivates uh, you know, the development of simulation methods adapted to non pali noise model to get reliable estimate of fault tolerance, not, not just threshold, but also overhead okay, and failure rates. Okay, so let me now move to the last topic. Uh, which is decoding. So, uh, <clears throat> so there are, whenever you perform simulation of, of quantum error correction, there, there's always two levels of difficulty. Um, one is just simulating the physical process, 
and the other one is decoding. If the only thing you've ever done is simulating Pali noise model, you've never paid attention to the problem of simulating the physical system because you know, you're just keeping track of Pali matrices. Uh, but if you have a non-Pali noise model, uh, well, you, you have to you know, simulate Born's rule and simulate the collapse and things like this. And these are, you know, this is quantum mechanics. It's hard. Uh, OK, but, um, but OK, so let's go back now to Pali noise model. The decoding problem, which is trying to figure out what's the optimal recovery given an error syndrome, and this is in general a hard problem. It's sharply hard. Uh, <clears throat> but for some class of code, there are efficient decoding algorithms. So now if you move on to non-Pali noise model, well, things can only get worse because they're a superset. Uh, <clears throat> so, um, so, you know, we have heuristic approximate decoding algorithm for the surface code, but it doesn't mean that we have some for non-Pauli noise model. However, for decoding purposes, you could always use a Pauli approximation and say, all right, so I know the real channel is amplitude damping. I will twirl that. I will tell my decoder uh, that it's, it's a Pauli channel, but I will simulate the amplitude damping channel, okay? So, I want to I want to emphasize here I'm not saying that I'm going to use an approximation in my simulation I'm suggesting using an approximation in my decoder okay and then I can do the full simulation and and check what it what what happens so this is a trick that you can use it's I mean it certainly gives you a decoder it's suboptimal but it will be provided that you have a, you had an efficient decoder for pali noise model well this will give you an efficient decoder for non pali noise model uh, and, you know, this is a trick that you can apply, apply more broadly. Uh, you can say, maybe the, the noise model is correlated, but I'm not going to tell my decoder that it's decoded, and it's just going to run, assuming an IID noise model, and we'll see what happens. Uh, now, uh, the simulations that, we, that we've done for either for uh, uh, concatenated code or for surface code, uh, in fact, uh, you know, because you end up computing the logical CPTP map, you get a decoder for free. Okay? It's kind of a byproduct of the simulation as a decoder. Uh, so if you combine this with efficient approximate ten contraction scheme for tensor network, that provides an efficient decoder for a very, very wide range of non-PALI and or correlated noise model. Okay? So for instance, for the surface code, any noise model that's a that, that can be described by a two-dimensional tensor network can be decoded uh, with this method. Okay, so how, how does this affect uh, decoding? Uh, <clears throat> so here, um, here's an example. We've simulated on the surface code uh, the uh, uh, damping channel. Uh, up here is if you tell the decoder that it's an IID noise model and you use matching, this is the, the logical error rate that you get. Here it's measured uh, with uh, the diamond distance, so it's between 0 and 2. It looks like an error above 1. Uh, uh, and, uh, and if you, these two lines, which are almost indistinguishable, are decoders using tensor network, one of which is efficient and one of which is exponential. Okay? So this just is just to show that as far as decoding goes, um, using approximate contraction scheme seems to work pretty well. Okay? We don't seem to lose by going to a, an efficient algorithm as opposed to an exponential algorithm. Okay. These are results that we have obtained for a spatially correlated noise model. Uh, so um, first we were wondering how should we generate correlated errors, and we decided to just uh, use a classical Ising model uh, where spin down is favored and there's a ferromagnetic or anti ferromagnetic interaction. And whenever a spin is pointing up, uh, this, is, this indicates the location of an error. Okay? So a, a StatMec model induces correlation on the noise. And now we are able to plot like this logical failure rate as a function of the average magnetization, or if you prefer, the average number of uh, bit flips, and j, which is just you know, the, 
the, the coupling strength in the Ising model, which is some measure of correlation. And uh, what you see, of course, is that you know, for a given error rate, if you increase the correlation, you're going from red to blue. Uh, and oh, I did not put the, yeah, the color shows minus log 10 of the logical error rate. So uh, errors, uh, the logical error rate increases with correlation. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> but this is just to show that you know, we are able to uh, simulate and efficiently decode correlated noise model. Okay, so uh, that brings me to my conclusion. So the question which was motivating this line of research is given a physical noise rate epsilon, how much error correction do I need to achieve a uh, logical noise rate delta? Um, and uh, we've used methods from quantum anybody physics to address this question for surface code and concatenated code. Um, and um, the idea can be extended to other families of codes. Uh, and here are a few things that we have found. For fixed, fixed physical noise rate, as measured by any of the standard metrics, uh, the logical failure rate can fluctuate by several orders of magnitude. Okay, so, it's, um, so, so we cannot predict the logical failure rate. The diamond norm is no better than other norms in that regard. In fact, it's a little bit worse. Uh, the logical failure rate of Pauli approximations can differ by several orders of magnitude uh, um, from the true failure rate. And in both of these sentences, several means 10. Okay? Uh, so, um, and as, as measured by the diamond norm, uh, incoherent noise is the worst. So the depolarizing channel was the absolute worst. That's maybe the one piece of good news from this talk. Uh, and also, we found that the twirl approximation seems to give reasonable threshold estimate, but that's just for a handful of example. And uh, a byproduct of this was uh, a, a decoder for non-pally and correlated noise model on the surface code. So um, I think that the, uh, so this was mostly bad news, but I think that this, these type of simulations still have, um, um, their use. Uh, so now we've just like explored the space of CPTP map, but I think it would be good to work closer to experimentalists and say, all right, what's the CPTP map that describes your, uh, your, your device and, and use simulations uh, around that point to do things like, okay, here's, here's the logical failure rate that you get, you know, given the CPTP map that you've described to me. Let me compute a gradient and tell you what parameter of that CPTP map is really killing you. Uh, so you think that you, know, you need to improve your T2 time, but you know, the simulation tell me that, no, it's this, this off matrix element. That that's what's really killing you. And if you could improve this by a factor of two, uh, you know, the logical fault rate would drop an order of magnitude. Uh, right. Uh, so in some sense, this is motivating the question, uh, what features of a physical noise rate are critical for fault tolerance? Uh, so another idea that we had is that, okay, we're sitting on this gigantic database of uh, hundreds of thousands of channels, and, and we know for each one of them how well they perform on their error correction. So can't we just use machine learning techniques to extract, to learn what are the uh, the, uh, the, the critical parameters, right? So here's the thing you should be measuring if you want to know uh, how well your channel performs in an error correcting scheme. So uh, Pavitran will be giving, presenting a poster uh, on what, which shows some partial results that we've obtained. Um, but uh, I mean, the, you know, go to his poster, but it's, it doesn't work so well, unfortunately. Uh, so uh, it seems like a tough problem. Uh, but check out his poster anyway. Uh, yeah, so if you could find such critical parameters, you could try to you know, figure out if they, they have an intuitive meaning and if they can be measured experimentally, that would be great. Uh, but we haven't managed to do this yet. Okay, and just to conclude, also a little bit of advertising, which essentially says if you wanna uh, visit Sherbrooke, we, we're hiring a bunch of people, um, either postdoc, grad students, or, or visiting faculty or faculty, in fact. Anyway, if you're interested in any of those, just come and talk to me. All right, so thank you for your attention.
time for a couple of questions. 